This morning's scripture is found in Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 17 on page number 848 in the Bibles under the chairs in front of you. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Katie. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here. Hey, listen, uh, we start home groups this week, and um, uh, most of the home groups start this week. And, and I wanted to, I, I know there's a lot of you that are involved in them. And I thought, you know, it'd be really nice for us to just, before we kick off the season and go ahead into the fall, for us to pray for that. So if you are involved in hosting, leading a home group in any way, stand. I want, I want to see who you are. Go ahead and stand. Go ahead. Come on, come on, come on. Get, 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 there you go. There you go. And, and I, want to, I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God will move and, and will do something great in our midst when, uh, when you come together and we start to build community. Okay, so let's, let's just bow our heads and pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for these who are saying, man, I want to be vulnerable enough to be, to lead, to host, to, to be a part of a home group. And I ask you, God, to, uh, to prepare hearts. I pray, Lord, that this semester would be a semester of great growth for people, where they would come, they would feel like they belong, and, uh, and Lord, they would, they would discover more about your word and what you want to do in their lives, God. So, so bless them and help them, I pray, and let it be a season where we see great growth, because God, we know that you do some of your greatest work in relationships. And so, God, we want to see that done in our lives. Bless each person that will participate in these, I pray. We love Love you, Jesus. We thank you for it, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Well, hey, listen, uh, if you've read Mark's gospel, and I hope you will do that at some point, uh, it'll take you maybe 45 minutes if you're a, a, a slow reader like me, um, then you know that there's these people that sort of swirl around the life of Jesus. There's the 12 apostles, that means sent ones, that Jesus calls, I believe it's back in Mark chapter 2, he calls them, he says, I'm going to send you out, and you're going you're gonna to teach and, and, uh, and heal people and, and kind of be my representatives in the world. And so they leave everything to follow Jesus, and, uh, and, and Mark kind of paints them, you know, in a very realistic pe- pe- uh, uh, with a paintbrush. I mean, he's th- these guys are are messed up. Uh, they don't know what they're doing. These aren't perfect, you know, saints. That they are normal human beings with frailties and all, and yet they have this deep desire to know, to worship, to be obedient to Jesus. Uh, And so that's the apostles. There's this other group, and it's just kind of the crowd, the crowd that follows him from here to there and goes wherever Jesus goes uh, because they are blown away by this seemingly ordinary man who can do these extraordinary things. And so they follow him, right? Because basically all the extraordinary things that Jesus does in some ways benefits them, right? I mean, Jesus doesn't just do magic tricks, you know, like David Blaine, where you go, wow, how'd you do that? He's he's a guy who heals people, right? He he touches you. He he, he, you know, lepers come to him and they're healed, demon-possessed people healed and delivered. And, and so this is a very personal thing. And they think, man, we want to be around this guy. They, they didn't necessarily buy into his mission and his message and, and all that, but, but they, they liked him a lot and made him wildly popular. But then there's this third group that follows Jesus, his entire ministry, and they are the religious leaders, Right? They're kind of the religious Gestapo, and they're, they're watching Jesus carefully. They followed him for his entire ministry. And these are guys who everyone in Israel, if you were a, a Jew, looked up to these men as, uh, as godly, as respectable, as what apparently God wants us to be like. And, uh, but they had absolutely no intention of following in an obedient way Jesus and his teachings. In fact, they followed him to figure out ways to kill him. We're going to see this. We saw it a couple weeks ago. They wanted to destroy him. They have no intention of going, Jesus, you're God, and I'll stake my life on following you. You know, you have really upset my whole theological framework, but, but you're who you say you are and we'll follow you. But they do want to look good. 
right? They do want people to respect them. They do want people to look up to them. They, they like to appear like they're godly without actually having to be godly, which just blows my mind. Why would you even want to do that? What's the point? Uh, so because they don't want to submit to Jesus, but do want to look religious and godly, they play games with Jesus. And this is what we've been seeing the last few weeks. I mean, they come and they're trying to trap him and they're trying to say things and give you sort of word games and maybe Jesus will fall into this one and Jesus never falls into any of them. And so they play these games. Now look, there are things you play games with and there are things you don't, right? Like Tucker and I used to love to play airsoft. Anybody know what airsoft is? It's, you know, you got these really realistic guns and we went out and bought a couple of really realistic guns and they shoot these hard plastic BBs really fast other people, and if you do it right, they bleed. And so we loved playing this with each other, right? We'd hide and you know, just light each other up and other friends would get together. And it's, it's, it was just a, a, a lot of fun. Okay. Well, that's fun. That's a great game. But, okay, I, but I also have a shotgun. And Tucker and I have never gone, hey, you know, it'd be great. Let's put our masks on, hide from each other, and then, you know, fire off a couple of rounds in the house, right? That'd be awesome. Okay. There are guns you play with. There's guns you leave at home because they'll kill you, Right. There's animals you play with, right? And animals you don't. Now, a lot of people don't think that's true, which is why we have the show When Animals Attack. But, but you, you see, like, like everybody thinks these, these apex predators are in fact, you know, uh, domesticated. And so there's the supermodel trying to sell jeans and she gets mauled by the lion, right? This, this, the, you, you think you can play with this thing and it, it doesn't work like that, okay? But then there's animals that God intended to be domesticated and you can play and they're fun. And then there's animals because of the fall that will now chew your face and your hands off. You don't play with them, okay? So, so, so there's things you play with, there's things you don't. Now, if you've ever read the Chronicles of Narnia, then you know there's that very famous line in the first one, uh, the line, the witch in the wardrobe, where they meet Mr. Beaver and, and he's telling about Aslan. Aslan's the, the lion and he's, he, he represents the Christ figure in the whole uh, series. And, and Mr. Beaver famously says he's not a tame lion. And then he goes on to say he's, he's not safe, but he's good. Okay, I love this. I mean, nails it right on the head. And yet, so many of us think, well, he's totally safe. He's totally tame. And so we play games with Jesus. And this is what's happening, right? We think we can do that. We, we think we can avoid real issues. We, we, we think that we can go through life and, and God is going to play this game with us. And it's cool with him and it's not. And so I want you to see this is what's going on in Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 17. Once again, we're back to playing games. And the passage has an interesting history of interpretation. Okay, if you're reading the ESV, the English Standard Version, which is the, the Bible's there near you, you'll see the heading, paying taxes to Caesar. Now, that's true. This is what this is about. But, but so this, this passage has had an interesting history. Some are going to use this passage to argue for the separation of church and state, right? That this is what Jesus intended. Others are going to say, well, no, this is, this is a biblical justification. What Jesus was after is getting us to pay taxes even to a corrupt government. Well, well so, so basically this becomes a civics lesson, right? Um, but that doesn't make sense because the whole context of everything we've been looking at the, the, the last few weeks is, is this is in the midst of battle. This is in the midst of all this, the, the, you know, the, these, these men coming against Jesus and resisting him and not wanting to be obedient. And Jesus keeps calling them to, to be obedient and to submit. And, and so there's one argument after another with these men, right? And you're gonna see another one next week. They just keep doing this. And so Mark isn't all of a sudden interested in teaching us a government lesson. Like, that's not what this is about. The whole point of the passage is that these guys keep trying to avoid the big questions of their heart. They, 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 they keep trying to play games. And one question doesn't work, so let me try another. That doesn't work, so let me try another. And let's send other people and new representatives. This week's the Pharisees and the Herodians. Next week, you're going to meet a group called the Sadducees. Okay? They're not interested in the truth. Okay, they're not interested, they're, they're, they're interested in playing games. God starts to press on their hearts. He leans against them. They start to realize back in chapter 12, verse 12, hey, he's talking about us. Oh, this is, this is applicable to us, but, but no, we don't want to listen. And rather than repent, they just go on playing their games. They try to change the subject. They try to figure out clever ways of ignoring the message. Okay, now that's the backdrop. So let's start reading 
again in, in Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 13. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. Now, who are these guys? Pharisees, they're the biggest of the religious leaders, the biggest group of religious leaders. The Herodians, uh, are, are the, these are secular people that followed Herod, okay? This is, these are strange bedfellows. These people don't normally like each other, but since the enemy of my enemy is my friend, then let's get together because we both hate Jesus. We both hate what he's doing. And so let's combine our forces to, uh, to, you know, to attack this problem. Okay, so, so now they come and they want to trap him. You see this? This is a hunting term, by the way. It's a term that, that means, you know, they, they kind of set this trap. They lay it out for him. They want to figure out a way to see if they can, they can you know, go, look, you just got yourself caught. They, they, what they're looking for is a, is a loophole that will justify their wickedness and get rid of this Jesus whose pesky presence is really keeping them from living lives the way they want to live them. It's a game. Some of you play this game with Jesus. You, you, don't, you don't come to church. They, they didn't come, hey, Jesus, want to listen to you. They came to trap him. They came to figure out ways that why this doesn't apply. And some of you come to church and you listen to Jesus, but you don't, you don't have a humble heart that desires to submit. You come and the whole time you're trying to figure out why this doesn't apply to me. It may apply to this person sitting next to me, but not me. And God leans on your heart and some of you have felt this and, and because you don't like what he's saying, Right? Then you get mad, you get angry, whatever, or, or you try to change the subject. Right? You try to go, well, you know, no, let, let's talk about something else. And all, all you do is you, you just want to get your religious duty done week after week. And so you check your box and, and now you can go back to living for yourself. You, you've had your hour of religion. And the crazy thing is you think God is okay with that game. Go live however I want, but this one hour a week, God's okay as long as I do this. Like, so Christianity is a hobby to you, which is just the lamest hobby in the universe. I mean, this is dorky, right? We get together, we sing, we clap, we raise our hands. I mean, go, go get a boat, <laughs> right? Go, go, go hike a mountain. This, this is not a good hobby. So, so, so or worse, you act religious when there's no real heart change, which is exactly what these guys are doing. Man, they got all the pomp and ceremony around them. But now, listen to how they do this. Let's go to verse 14. And they came and said to him, now listen to this. Teacher, we know that you are true and don't care about anyone's opinion for you're not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Now, this is just dripping with sarcasm. I mean, they, they don't mean one word of what they're saying, right? Their hearts and their words are not in alignment here, are they? Okay, but, but, but they want to appear pious, right? They, 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 want to, they, they want people to think they're religious, good people, that Jesus is very popular. So we're going to come to Jesus with soft words. They don't want to be look, look like jerks, so they disguise what they really feel with soft, flattering words. We'll butter him up for when we get to the really hard part, and then he'll, his defense will be down. And the Bible says that people, it says this in several places, Psalms and Proverbs and other places, talks about how there are men who flatter with their tongues, but their throats are an open grave. It's such a, such a vivid picture. Right? I don't want to swallow you up after I butter you up, right? And yet everything they say, notice this, Everything that comes out of their mouth is, is actually true. Teacher, we know that you're true. They're right. Jesus is true. Jesus doesn't take an opinion poll to make sure he only says things that are popular. Right? And I love this about Jesus, especially in an election year, right, where, where candidates say as little as possible so nobody will be offended. The only opinion that matters to Jesus is God's, and I love that. He never set out to be popular, but people flocked to him because he just spoke the truth. Now, I realize you can take that a lot of ways, right? Some of you'd be like, yeah, right on. You know, so that gives me a permission to go out and be a jackass. 
And, 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 and look, I just, you're just like one of those guys who's like, I say, I say everything that comes into my mind. I have no filter. I just call it like I see it. Well, good for you. Okay. But, but look, there's a difference between being a jackass and being like Jesus. You understand? They're completely different. Okay. Jesus wanted to make a difference. He wanted his words to reconcile. He wanted his words to heal. He wasn't just out to prove a point. And he wasn't just out to be the loudest guy in the room. I got to have my opinion heard. Like some of you do, right? If you're in a room and some subject comes up and you're going to be heard. That, that's not what Jesus is after. Jesus is saying, look, what I'm, I'm true. I'm true. Jesus, he, they say, Jesus, you're, you're not swayed by anyone's uh, opinion, right? For, for you're, you're not swayed by appearances. Look at that. It literally, if you look at the footnote, it's, it, it literally in the Greek says that he doesn't look at men's faces. You understand what he's saying? It doesn't mean he walks his head down. I don't know who I'm talking to right now. It, it's, a, it's an idiomatic expression that means, look, truth is truth. It doesn't change based on if the person sitting in front of me is a president or a pauper, right? It, it, it's, it's I'm going to speak the truth to whoever is in front of me. And so, so, it, it, and so Jesus says, look, I, I'm not swayed. It doesn't matter how powerful or not you are. You're going to get the truth from me. They're, they're saying what's true. And again, I mean, so many people change the truth based on who's asking the question and listening to the answer. Okay, again, an election year. Or you get these guys, you know, Larry King invites onto their show and they're Christians. They're the people that write all the books or whatever. And, and so he'll invite them on and say, come on, really seriously, you, you teach that Jesus is the only way and, and, uh, and that seems so narrow. And what's the answer? What, is Jesus the only way? The answer is yes. I didn't write the book that's what the Bible says. And instead, you get sort of this vacillating, well, I mean, I think he's the best way. There might be a better ways, but Jesus is the best way. What is that? It's like I'm, I'm swayed by who's sitting in front of me and the millions of people that are watching me. Jesus won't do that. And then the religious leaders, they end and they ask the big question. And this is a question that could put their hoping Jesus on the horns of a dilemma and there's no winning way to answer it. Look what he says. They, they ask him, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? Now, let, let me explain what's happening. Why, why is this even a question? Okay, there was a... Um, the, 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 there's, a, there's a coin um, back in AD 6, um, Rome instituted a tax against the Jewish people, and they were already taxed terribly, um, and, and they instituted this tax where they said, you, you have to pay a denarius, and you'll see this in a minute, okay, you have to pay a denarius, and, it's, and, and this is not an egregious amount, okay, it probably would be like uh, the equivalent for us of about $30 a year, okay, here was the problem. The denarius was a, was a Roman coin. You couldn't pay it any other way. You had to pay with this Roman coin. And this Roman coin had on it the inscription of uh, the, the face of Caesar Tiberius. And around it was this description of who this was. And it described him as the divine son of God. The divine son of Caesar Augustus, the God, uh, the, 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 the God emperor. And so... so the Jews saw this and said, no, 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 this is horrible. This is, this is not something that we want to be carrying around. We don't believe that he's the divine son of God. And, and it felt like desecration to them and blasphemy and all of that. And, and so they hated this tax. Not only, you know, what it represented, the domination of Rome and all that. And so they come to him and they're like, hey, okay, let's see. If he says yes, you should pay the tax, well, then all the Jews are going to be upset at him. And this is perfect. We want to destroy him. But if he says no, then all these Herodians who side with Rome are going to hear it, and they're going to go back and report that Jesus is being treasonous, telling people not to pay their taxes, and that's going to bring Rome down on his head. So, right? So we're going to catch him. But Jesus isn't going to play that game with them. Rather, he's going to point out the real issue, and he's a genius, right? I mean, this is, this is amazing how he does this. So, so let's, let's keep reading verse 15. But knowing their hypocrisy, now stop right there. I told you, remember we said already, we know you don't care about anybody's opinions for you're not swayed by appearances. 
It's very interesting, by the way, because in, in again, that, if that means you don't look at anybody's faces, <laughs> at idiomatic expression, what's hypocrisy? Hypocrisy, it's the Greek word hypocritos, and it comes from the theater, and it literally means the wearer of a mask. So, so Jesus doesn't look at men's faces uh, un- unless you're wearing a mask, uh, unless you're pretending to be someone you're not. That's what a hypocrite is. And Jesus sees right through it. They're pretending to be godly and they're wicked. They're pretending to be nice and flattering and they really want to kill him. Their throats are an open grave. Now look it. This is so destructive wherever you find it, hypocrisy. And it's especially destructive in religion. Especially destructive in spiritual circles. Like how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, how many of you would say that you've been wounded, hurt, have some kind of hypocritical interaction with a church leader in the past? And by that I mean like maybe they had an affair. Maybe a former pastor of yours, you know, ended up having sex with his secretary, whatever. What happened? It was devastating. What happens Here's a man, maybe a woman in your past who said he or she was on mission with Jesus and it turned out they weren't submitted to Jesus. Here's here's somebody who went through all the right motions but it turns out their hearts were in a very different place. That's hypocrisy and it is devastating. And Jesus looks right through it and says, no way. So he says, knowing their hypocrisy, he says, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. Okay, so so they bring him, it says verse 16, and they brought one and he looks at it and he goes, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Now, uh, I want you to notice the question Jesus asked there in verse 16 because it seems like a minor question. Hey, just look at the coin. What do you see? He didn't say that. He chooses his language very carefully. Whose likeness and inscription is this? Caesar's. Okay. Uh, That's a deeper question than it sounds like. Uh, the, the word likeness, some of your, some of your uh, translations will say image. Um, it's the Greek word that mean, means like icon, image, okay, that, which, which doesn't sound to- very significant. But here, here's the thing. It's the same exact word. When, when, when the Greek translators, there, we have this book called the Septuagint. You all know what the Septuagint is. The Septuagint is a Greek translation written before the time of Christ, a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Now, this is significant, and here's why. Because these translators had to look at the Hebrew and then decide what Greek word, much, much closer to the original, what Greek word would we use to translate some of these things? Okay, so they go to Genesis, where God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and guess what word they choose? This one. They use the exact same word that Jesus uses. See, what this is a loaded question. Okay, so, so, so they say, uh, uh, this is Caesar's, Caesar's image. Now, now, now hold on to that thought just for a second and let's read verse 17. So Jesus says to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled. Now, (laughs) this is where it gets interesting. Jesus is basically saying this. There's this coin. And if it's stamped with the image of Caesar, then give it to Caesar. But essentially, I see another coin. Okay. If it's stamped with the image of God, it belongs to God. Okay, do you see where he's going with this? It belongs to him. So Pharisees, Herodians, Christians, people of all ages, I could care less about the tax you pay. 
There is a much bigger issue at stake. This is mere money. But there's a bigger issue, namely you being the image bearer of God rendered to God. You giving up ownership of yourself. You coming under God's authority. You owe him that as your maker, as the image bearer, and you show that, he, that his law is inscripted on your heart. That's what every human being, every person in this room, everybody who ever lived was designed to be someone that reflected the image of God the way that he desires through worship. And Mark says they marveled at him. Right? They're astonished. They're just blown away. I mean, they, they cannot believe this, that he's able to take their question, turn it back on them, spring their trap, and they're caught in it. See, this isn't about taxes at all. It's about you and it's about me. It's about who gets supremacy in your life. Who gets you, not just your money. It's about whether you will keep trying to play games with Jesus or finally own up to the fact that God claims ownership over your life and you give him what, he, what you, you owe to him. It's about who's going to be your Lord. Will it be Caesar and his systems, right? The world. You know, the, the money, career, power, sex, politics, selfish ambition, pride, worship of self, oppression, injustice, discord, war. I mean, go on and on. Is, is, that, is that the system you're going to serve or is it going to be God and his kingdom? Sacrifice and reconciliation and peace and beauty and harmony and rhythm and, and, and eternal riches and worship of God and on and on. See, it, it's, about, it's about what law is written on your heart, about whose, whose image is stamped there and whether or not you have a heart of stone, according to Ezekiel and Jeremiah, or if God's taken out that heart of stone and given you a heart of flesh that now wants to be obedient to him and worship him. But now let me, let me kind of turn it another angle and maybe you can see it a little more plainly. Um, look, look at his answer again. Jesus says to them, okay, so now he's going to give them the answer, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Now, that ought to do something like you ought to be going, okay, I don't quite get that. It's kind of ambiguous, but what it's going to make these guys do what Jesus wants it to do in the hearts of these men who are questioning him and what he wants it to do for us is that they've got to walk away. You've got to walk away and go, so, so let's think about that answer he just gave. What belongs to Caesar? And what belongs to God? Now here, here's what most, oh, oh, the coin belongs to Caesar. Give it to Caesar. Everything else belongs to what, something, you know, I belong to God, Whatever. Okay, so, so, and I want to suggest to you, this is exactly what Jesus wanted us to read, wanted us to see, is the sort of ambiguity around this, and so that we're forced to answer the question. And do you know how the Bible answers the question, what belongs to Caesar and what belongs to God? It says, none of it belongs to Caesar. This is a way more treasonous answer than they can possibly imagine. None of it belongs to Caesar all of it belongs to God. Okay, let, let me show you what I mean. Tur turn back with me. If you're using the, the Bibles in your chairs, turn back with me to, to Second Chronicles, or First Chronicles 29, uh, verse 10. And it's on page uh, 357, I believe. And let me, just, let me just read to you. This is a prayer of David. Okay, and I, and I want you to hear, that we could show, I could show you several places, but I want you to hear this prayer. Listen to David. David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And said, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory 
and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you. You rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Okay, let's look at another one. Turn over to Second Chronicles chapter 20, page 372, I think it is. Second Chronicles chapter 20, and look at, look at verse 6. Here's Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat's desperate. People are coming. There's this multitude coming against him. He doesn't know what to do. He says, God, our eyes are on you. Look at verse 6. O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Here's the point. God owns it all. Okay, Abraham Kuyper was famous for saying that there is not one square inch in all of creation over which Jesus does not say, mine. Everything belongs to Jesus. Everything belongs to God. God owns it all. You bear the image of God, so you belong to God. Every ruler that is out there belongs to God. Everything you own belongs to God. All of your time belongs to God. All of your money belongs to God. All of your possession belongs to God. So whether or not you recognize that everything in the heavens and the earth is God's and it came from his gracious hand to you. Caesar doesn't own Jack. That's the point. Caesar is a steward in the service of God, believe it or not. And the world may lie under the power of the seduction and the glory of Caesar and look at it and say, wow, isn't that glorious? And I can see that and none of it is his. None of it. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. What's that? Nothing. Render to God's what is God's. What's that? Everything. Now look at, okay, just, just so we're clear, this is not an argument for not paying taxes because the Bible, very clearly, Romans chapter 13, one through seven, you haven't read it, read it. Very clearly, you pay your taxes. And if you're thinking, well, yeah, but I don't like the government. Well, go live in Rome and be a Christian. And this is who Paul's talking to, Okay. And he says, pay your taxes. Okay, so this is, this, is, this is not what Jesus is after. He's not like, I want to try to give you a civics lesson and tell you to pay your taxes. Jesus is saying, kings and kingdoms come and go. I raise them up, I put them down. I own it all, so you better make sure you are giving to God his due. It all belongs to God. So let me ask you the obvious question. What are you rendering to Caesar and what are you rendering to God? Because we play this game. We play this game all the time. Who gets highest priority in your life? Who gets priority over your pocketbook? Who gets priority over your relationships? Who gets priority over your time? Who gets priority in how you use the incredible gifts and skills that God has given you? Who, who's got you? Where do you find your identity? If your career got pulled away from you, would your identity go? If your money got pulled, would your identity go? If some relationship in your life got pulled away, would your identity go or is it in God? See, this is a huge, huge question, and most of us invest massive amounts of time, energy, money, etc., into the world system, and very little at all rendering to God what is God's. We think all the time about rendering to Caesar what is Caesar's. And I think Jesus isn't saying, hey, take your life, split it up, and you got the Caesar stuff, give it to him, and you got the God stuff, give it to him. Not at all. I think he's going, if you stop and you think about it, it's all God's. There's no, this is God time, this is my time. Right? Don't, don't we all think of that? Oh, it's Sunday. I can't cuss on Sundays. <laughs> I only listen to certain kind of music on Sundays. Because it's Sunday, right? I mean, this is the holy day. I don't look at porn on Sunday. Well, Actually, most people do. 
right? So, 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 so we separate, look at. This is what Jesus is doing. He's pushing back on these leaders and he's going, look, they're going to do what most of us do. Walk away this morning and try to come up with reasons why you can ignore Jesus again. Why you're done with your religious duty. Why this message doesn't apply to you, right? Everybody else, maybe, why Jesus is speaking to everybody else but you and you keep playing the game. And it's a dangerous, dangerous game because look it, in the end, you won't win. <laughs> Just so you know, God will. And if you wanna hear uh, kind of how this all plays out in the end, Galatians chapter six, read it sometime, verses seven and eight. Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, he also reaps. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Do you hear, do you hear what's being said? <laughs> God won't be mocked. Some of you mock him with your lives. It means, look it, it means God won't be played with. God won't be scorned. You, you will not treat his word with scorn, refuse to listen, right? And if you do that, if every time he leans against you, every time he presses against your heart, you try to change the subject or figure out why, oh, he's not speaking to me or whatever, he's saying, I'm not gonna play that game, right? If you're a parent, right, you've done this with your kids. You'll be like, I gotta talk to you about something, and then suddenly they wanna change the subject. Like, whoa, 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 no, 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 we're gonna talk about this, and they do that enough and you're finally like, hey, no, no more. I know what you're doing. You're playing a game with me and I'm not going to play that game. And God's saying, look, at some point he's going to say, that's it. You're, you're not going to play that game. See, see here's, here's what I'm, I'm pleading with some of you. God is leaning on some of you and you keep changing the subject. He's pushing on your heart and you keep refusing to submit. You keep making excuses. You keep going, that sin that I'm involved in, I can keep doing that. I, I, I don't need to listen to God about that. And you're choosing Caesar over God. You're choosing slavery over freedom because you honestly believe going back to Egypt is gonna make you happier. Some of you don't know Jesus Christ as your savior and he's leaning against you. Can I, can I just tell you something that I've discovered? One of the secrets of the Christian life, right? Shh, don't tell anybody. Uh, you, you know where you feel the greatest friction in your heart? Think about it. Wherever you feel that greatest friction, where God is, that's called conviction, that's exactly where God is trying to do his best work in you. Don't, don't change the subject. Don't keep trying to play this game. And don't keep trying to live in these two worlds. Oh, so Jesus says there's a Caesar world and there's a God world. No, it's all God's world. And quit trying to go, oh, I've got my, I've got my life and my secular life or whatever you want to call that. And then I've got kind of my religious life over here and, and whatever I call that. No, no, no. You look at it and go, it all comes together. It all comes together. You got money, it's God. Does that mean you can't spend any and can't have any fun with your money? Of course not. I mean, the Bible's gonna say one of the things, one of the, one of the great gifts that God gives to his people is he, he, it's a gift that we get to enjoy what he's given us. God's not a killjoy. But God does say it's all mine. So, so you, better, you better think twice about how you spend God's money. You better think twice about how you use God's possessions. They better be rendered to God. You better think a lot about how you use your time and render it to God. Michelle and I were talking yesterday. And, and the truth of the matter is, um, you know, we do Saturday night services and we do two on Sunday. And when we started the whole Saturday night service, we all as a staff, we knew we are, we are opting for a different lifestyle because that means that basically I have a day off during the week and I don't have a full day off with my kids and my whole family. 
Okay, now I'm not, I'm not crying. I'm not like, you know, please feel sorry for me and send me pity letters. I'm not, that's not it. I'm telling you this for a reason. Because if we are talking and sort of venting our frustrations about sometimes, you know, Saturday night service, we love it and we love the people there. And at the same time, we don't get time with the family as much as we want. And, and so you start feeling like is, you know, we got our God time and, 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 and we got our family time over here. And every time we do that, we feel frustrated. We feel robbed. We feel like, wait a minute, God. But every time we stop, take a step back and go, wait a second. It, it's, not, it's not six hours a week are God's or 10. 168 hours a week are God's. It's all his and he can give it and take it as he pleases. And when we start thinking like this, well, the pity party goes away. Now you're like, okay, it's all God's. It's all God's. Use it the way you want to use it, Lord. You see this? So, so look, I'm, I'm pleading with you. What's God saying to you? How's he leaning against your heart? How, how's he revealing you know, what he's saying to you. Don't change the subject. Don't try to bifurcate your life into Caesar and God. Christian, especially you. You've been delivered from the domain of darkness. Why would you run back to slavery? And if you're not a Christian and you're here this morning and God's leaning on your heart, don't, don't change the subject. Don't harden your heart. You have no idea what's in store for you. He wants to set you free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You don't have to render to Caesar. You render to God. The best master in the universe who will care for you, love for you, forgive you, show you mercy, grace. That's the God we serve. Let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, for the way that your word pushes on our heart. And God, um, I know our, our human nature wants us to resist, wants to run away. But God, I pray we'd embrace what you're trying to say to us. Some of us have divided our lives into sacred and secular, and there is no such thing. Some of us have tried to look at you know, work is being one environment and home another environment, church another environment. And God, when it's all, like the church fathers used to say, it's all coram Deo, it's lived under the, the face of God, before the face of God. Lord, let us live all of our lives that way. And Father, I pray for anybody who's here this morning that doesn't know Jesus Christ, doesn't know, doesn't have that personal relationship. I'm not talking, God, I don't pray for religion I pray against religion. And I pray what would replace that God is a vibrant, living, healthy, powerful relationship with Jesus Christ. Do that, I pray this morning. Father, we love you. We want everything that we have to be yours. We want our lives to be rendered in worship every day to the Lord Jesus Christ. So help us, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name.